All right, now we're going to talk about something that is one of the more interesting things I've seen on the internet, which is dark net markets. So these are black markets that exist on the internet. Uh, a big famous one, one of the early ones, was the Silk Road. Uh, and this is a part of the internet that you can't find by Googling your way to it. It's a secret part of the internet where people do secret stuff. Now, some things that people do in the dark net, this um, part of the internet that is not easy to get to, this secret part of the internet, is perfectly legitimate. This is a place where whistleblowers will share information with journalists. Uh, this part of the internet was built by the U.S. Navy to enable them to securely share information. Uh, but it's also a place where people will share the sorts of information uh, or uh, make the sorts of trades that maybe we don't want them to make. Uh, illegal stuff does happen there. Now, why is this so interesting to me as an economist? Well, it boils down to the issue that this is people finding mutually beneficial exchange in a place, in a setting where the odds are stacked against them, where everything is sort of pointed away from making it possible. So if we have, well, let's just start with sort of the very basic notion. We've got person A and person B and person A has some good X, and person B has some good Y. And if they trade these goods, they get gains on both sides, right? So this is just saying for A, the marginal benefit of Y is greater than the marginal benefit of X, right, for person A. For person B, it's the other way around. Right? The marginal benefit of Y, which they're giving up, is less than the marginal benefit of what they get in exchange. Right? This is just standard economics, right? uh, the reverse coincidence of wants. So that's you know, the basic logic underlying any voluntary exchange. But we have this issue, and to understand this issue, it's helpful to think of this with a little tiny bit of game theory. So we'll illustrate this with a decision tree. So we've got these different nodes. So we start with person A gets to make some decision. Uh, and then we end up somewhere else where, where person B gets to make some decision. And if we're up here, maybe they make a particular decision. And maybe if we're down here, we don't get to make a decision. So this is sort of the very basic logic underlying the basic structure underlying an exchange so maybe we don't make the exchange and then up here we at least try to make some sort of a trade so if we don't make the exchange then person one gets a payoff of zero person two gets a payoff of zero right we're not getting the, the uh, benefits of the exchange if let's say person A sends some money to person B, and person B sends back some good, then person A is going to get whatever these differences are. Right? So we'll call this, say, GA for the gains for person A, and GB for the gains for person B. So if they make this exchange, then we get however good this trade is for A, however good this trade is for B, but we also have this possibility, which is that B doesn't make good. Um, so if B doesn't return the good that person A is paying for, then person A is going to get a negative payoff. Uh, what are they losing? They're giving up X, so they're going to be losing that marginal benefit that they would get from X and person B, their payoff is going to be the benefits that they get from X uh, and the benefits that they get from Y, right? So they're gonna get both of these things. Uh, so here, GB, this is really uh, the benefit from X minus the benefit lost from Y. In this case, I'm gonna be messy with my notation here. They're just gonna get X plus Y, right? They're gonna get whatever those benefits are 
Well, let's put it this way. Marginal benefits for person B of X and Y. All right, so this is a way to tell a story, but what we can do with this story is we can think about what does it make sense to do? Well, if you're person B, the way we've drawn this, they're basically choosing between do I get the good, the benefit from basically, what is this, y minus x, or do they get the benefit of y plus x? Well, we wouldn't expect b to ever go to this branch. So what we should expect is knowing this, person A looks at this and they say, well, I could either lose something or I could lose nothing. So they're not going to do that, and we've got an equilibrium. All right, the equilibrium to this strategic interaction is that no exchange happens. So how do we overcome this? Well, out in the world, we establish trust. We repeatedly interact with each other. We also have the law on our side. So if I make an order from eBay and the person doesn't send me the good, I can sue them. But if I'm buying heroin from a stranger on the internet, I'm not going to be able to sue anyone. Uh, the old way of dealing with this was to change this structure. Let's go ahead and draw it out again. So again, we have trade or not trade. And then we have person B sends out the good or they don't. And then if they don't, person A can, again, do nothing and just lose. Right. We'll just say the outcome is frowny face for A, happy face for B. But we also have this possibility of breaking their kneecaps. So if we use violence, we can enforce a contract. Right, And even when we have a legal market, at the end of the day, it's not so different from bringing up the possibility of breaking someone's kneecaps when they don't make good on the contract. In the case of the Silk Road, we're making, not we, but the people who are on the Silk Road were making exchanges that were not legally enforceable, but they also didn't have this option of breaking someone's kneecap. So given that, we're in an incredibly low trust situation. We have this thing that enables this to happen, right? Bitcoin. Bitcoin makes it so that A can give B that money, right? But there's no way to get a return of your Bitcoin if person B doesn't make good. So essentially what's going on at that point is the ultimatum game, which you saw the other video for. Now the ultimatum game is an interesting game. Sometimes it's shown like this. So instead of just two specific branches, we can kind of think of this as many different branches. And in this game, we have person A makes some offer to person B, right? Or actually, I'm going to label this as person B because really, this is sort of the second part of the tree. So given that person A has given some money to person B, basically person B can go back and they can say either, I'll give you the good that you want that makes you happy, or I'll give you, you know, not as much or as high quality as you expected, or maybe I give you nothing at all, right? And of course, for person B, so here's A's outcome, but for person B, their outcome is going to be, well, not as nice up here. It's not that it's going to be negative, right? It's a mutually beneficial exchange, but they'd be really happy if they could get away with giving you very, very little in this exchange. So the ultimatum game, this is one game theory story we can tell for a scenario where someone has basically a lot of power, but someone else has sort of the ability to completely reject the transaction at all. That's a nice simple game, but it's not quite what's going on here. This game, as we've drawn it here, let me draw it in a different color, is the trust game. And in the trust game, we basically have don't trust down here, or we trust, right? So person A gives the money to person B, and then either person B shows themselves to be trustworthy or they cheat. Right? And again, 
we can look at this and we can compare the payoffs that each person faces at each branch and we can ask which branches it makes sense for them to go on based on their benefits as a result. And if you're dealing with total strangers from the internet, well, we're way outside Dunbar's number. Transaction costs in that case are really high because of this issue of trust. So again, coming back to this, this is a fascinating example to me because people were able to overcome this issue of not being able to trust strangers. They had a way to pay, but they didn't have a way to make sure that they got their money's worth. So what did they do? Well, this was really the genius of the Silk Road, is they set up an escrow system. So now what goes on is we've got A wants to make an exchange with B. Right? Nice and easy, straightforward, mutually beneficial exchange, but A can't trust B. And for that matter, B kind of has to worry about A a little bit also because you know B's doing something illegal and they know they were there. I'm sure there still are dark nut markets and I'm sure that the FBI, the FBI and the DEA are still keeping a really close eye on those markets and trying to gather evidence on uh, people selling illegal goods uh, by you know, sending them something from the evidence locker and trying to use that exchange to figure out where B is. So we got this issue of trust. How do we overcome this issue of trust? We bring in a third person, person C, which was the people setting up the market as a whole. So what did they do? How did they change this exchange? Now they say, we want to give the money to B, but we're going to start by giving it to C. B gives their drugs or guns or whatever else they're buying to A. And when A says, we got the goods, then C releases the money to B. So it's bringing in another person in a low trust situation, which is difficult. But we have, again, a very Kosian story. Because of these high transaction costs, we're again getting this larger player involved. So the Silk Road, the company, I guess, was it a company? It was a company. It was uh, not a legal company, but it was a company. They now, as the escrow maker, the market maker, are in a situation where they get a small piece of of every exchange, right? They get some percentage, or they did before the FBI shut them down. Uh, so in that situation, they're essentially building brand name capital. So they are able to establish something that you can trust. So if the Silk Road was not doing a good job at this, they wouldn't be able to get any sellers. Right. And if it didn't work, they wouldn't get buyers. And if they're not getting both, they're not getting the network externalities. They're not building this. It's not feeding back on itself and growing. And they're missing out on the opportunity to make a lot of money. It's a really clever way to overcome this problem. We have a problem, which is there are two people who want to make a mutually beneficial exchange. Both of them are made better off if they exchange but we don't have the legal system in place to allow that uh, trust to be built. By creating a market that people do want to trust, you are able to overcome this. You're able to use the escrow system to keep the sellers honest. And as a result, you're able to bring in buyers and everyone involved is able to make some money. Now, that is pretty nice on paper, but at least the last time I looked at this, which was, I don't know, maybe four years ago, the basic underlying problem. Now, the basic underlying problem is this lack of trust, but the thing, the sort of big problem that was still existing even in this situation is exit scams. And there were two types of ways that exit scams happened. One is with B, 
right? So you might have a seller who builds a good reputation. Uh, so these basic systems, uh, basically you could either use the escrow system or you could, I think it was called finalize early. This is the check mark, right? So sometimes a seller would say, hey, we're doing a big sale and we're only giving the sale to people who finalize early. So you say, hey, you know, I want to go get a big old envelope full of drugs. So I'll, I'll just finalize early. I'm going to get a good deal. And B would make a bunch of these sales. And then you'd have a bunch of sellers waiting around. And then B would disappear. Right? They would just leave that particular market. They take the money and run. And then, of course, there's also the potential for the market itself to pull an exit scam. This is another thing that happens. So even with this, we don't have a perfect system with escrow, but we are able to overcome these trust problems enough to at least get some exchange happening in a setting where we shouldn't expect exchange at all. Now, this is interesting because, well, it's interesting because it's shedding some light on a larger economic problem. The problem underlying the big question of how do we understand Adam Smith's first project, not his first project, but his first project in economics, uh, making an inquiry into the wealth and nation, uh, sorry, the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. For that all to work, we need some form of governance, right? And in this case, what we had is what we can call a form of anarchic governance. There's no one in charge. There's no government. There's no one with a monopoly on force who can lock you in jail for not making good on your exchange. Instead, there was a decentralized set of multiple markets, right? So first it was the Silk Road, and then there were a bunch of other ones. I can't remember their names, but you can find this on Wikipedia uh, if you look it up. And they were able to essentially do this other thing that we've talked a little bit about here, which is private provision of public goods. So at the very least, this is a thing, an event that happened on the internet that has taught us something more interesting, more deep about other economic issues. But it's also an interesting example of how when we're dealing with strangers on the internet, how there are entrepreneurial opportunities to overcome these trust problems and to reduce these transaction costs. Right? The transaction costs for the Silk Road are very different than the transaction costs for Amazon. So that was a really neat thing. That was an early use of Bitcoin. Um, this whole market really gave Bitcoin a bad name uh, about a decade ago. Uh, it's recovering. There are, are more legitimate uses for Bitcoin uh, in the more recent history of cryptocurrency. But it is just a fascinating episode in the history of economies on the internet. Uh, so as usual, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask in the usual places, and I'll see you in the future.